was three mm -hmm. minutes past. So, uh, hello everyone. Welcome back to the Colloquia after about a month and a half of uh, mm -hmm. hopefully a break. Um, so, we are proud to have our local uh, Enrique Vasquez Semadani today to give a lecture. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Enrique obtained his PhD from the University of Texas, where he worked on turbulence in the uh, in molecular clouds with uh, John Scalo. And he has been, uh, uh, since he obtained his PhD, he has been at UNAM, which is uh, since 1991. Um, he has also uh, been a director of the Institute between 2015 and 2019. He's an expert on molecular clouds, the formation, growth, and dynamics of molecular clouds, and has made important strides in describing how turbulence affects these aspects. Uh, for this, he has used radio observations as well as numerical simulations. And uh, today he's going to tell us about the part that uh, accretion plays in the global hierarchical collapse of molecular clubs. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Sundar. And well, that's how I'm going to share. And well, I'm uh, happy to be starting the new semester uh, with, with a colloquium. And uh, basically, I'm going to talk to you about uh, something that has, you know, somehow sunken into my mind in the last couple of years or so, which is how important accretion is for the whole process of star formation, starting at the scale of perhaps uh, giant molecular clouds. And, uh, and so that's for doing a number of different uh, studies, uh, in all of them at different scales, it turns out that accretion plays a crucial role. And so trying to put it all together, uh, I came up with this talk, which I gave uh, a few weeks ago at a conference in France. And so it, it will be about the crucial role of accretion in the global hierarchical collapse flow leading to star formation. And I emphasize the word flow because another thing uh, uh, which is uh, going to be one of the main messages of this, this talk is that gravitational collapse is not an isolated point-like event that happens you know, at one moment and position in time. It rather creates flows that span uh, large scales and long time scales. And so my collaborators in, in, in all of these works that I'm going to be telling you about uh, are uh, numerous and all of them have been at the Institute at one point or another. Many of them have been my postdocs or my students or both, and uh, you'll see their names coming up uh, very uh, at various parts of the talk. So the outline of the talk is uh, the following. First, I, I would like to give you just a brief, brief uh, reminder of what this scenario of global hierarchical collapse is for molecular clouds and, and how it uh, leads to star formation how it implies accretion at all scales and also evolution of all the structures. Contrary to our ideas of stationary clouds that are more or less supported against gravity and things like that, in this scenario, everything is evolving, the clouds, the filaments, the clumps, and, um, and eventually the cores leading to star formation. And then I'm going to go and talk about accretion onto clouds, uh, how it, uh, leads the evolution from low to high mass star forming regions and how it leads to a very surprising result, which is that the mass of the clouds keeps growing even after they have begun forming stars. This is something that we didn't really expect, but it's something that came up in a paper last year with Alejandro Gonzalez. Um, and then uh, the accretion onto cores and how the accretion rates uh, onto the cores uh, depend on the, on the slope of the density profile. And that is a very interesting result because that is what determines or creates the possibility for clumps to grow without transferring all their, the mass they accrete from large scales to the stars. And also uh, another result uh, which involves accretion onto cores is the fact that the central parts of the cores are sort of crushed by the weight and the inflow from the, uh, from the mass uh, around them. And then finally, if I have time, I'll talk 
a little a little bit about accretion into filaments and the possibility that the the filaments are sort of stationary flows but not made of of just one uh, bulk of atoms or molecules they are just like a river transferring material the river is all, always there but the material is never the same and so that's what i'm going to be talking to you about so a very very brief reminder of what this global hierarchical uh, collapse scenario is which we uh, uh published in the paper a couple of, of years ago this is a scenario for molecular clouds Perhaps not only molecular clouds, but also their cold atomic envelopes. Molecular clouds are the regions where uh, stars form. They are the densest regions in, in, the, in the interstellar medium. And uh, they are the main hypothesis of the global hierarchical collapse scenario is that large cold atomic clouds and large molecular clouds are contracting gravitationally. That, that'll be our working hypothesis. Then during the contraction, because the, the, uh, the density of the cloud is increasing because there is gravitational contraction, the average genes mass decreases because the average genes mass for an isothermal gas goes like the density to the minus one half power. And therefore that means that the average genes mass is decreasing over time. And that means that if you have density fluctuations within the cloud of a certain typical mass, as time proceeds, the, these fluctuations will be able to collapse at uh, smaller and smaller masses because the, the genes mass, which is the limit for uh, gravitationally unstable masses, becomes smaller and smaller. So what this means is that the, the density fluctuations have uh, of smaller and smaller masses suddenly become uh, capable of collapsing. And this creates a regime of collapses within collapses. So it, it's a multi-scale pr uh, process. All scales accrete from their parent scale. Uh, and the lifetime of a structure, for example, a filament or a clump, is not its own free fall time. It's the free fall time of the parent structure, which is feeding it with material. Mm -hmm in a conveyor belt type of flow, and I'll uh, get back to, to what this means. Uh, but in this picture, the filaments are the accretion flow from the cloud scale to the core scale. Mm -hmm. and, and like I said uh, in the last transparency, then gravitational collapse implies a large scale flow and it is not an isolated instantaneous event. We tend to think of gravitational collapse only as its manifestation at the very last stage when a star forms, boom, just like a star forms there. But we don't realize that before that star formed, there was a large flow coming into uh, the region where the stars, uh, where the star form, formed. Because this means, because this is because the gas has to move from the low to the high density regions. And it turns out that the ride is very long. It can be in molecular clouds on the scale of several tens of parsecs. Mm -hmm. With that said, let me go into the accretion onto clouds. Mm -hmm. this, is, uh, this is a numerical simulation of uh, the warm atomic gas. So this is a numerical simulation of a region of 256 uh, parsecs uh, on the side. And it has initial turbulence, and then it, which is then decaying, and then it has a cooling, so it is multi-phase simulation uh, with uh, self-gravity. And so you see that the turbulence creates density fluctuations, and then the density fluctuations get denser and denser and denser by the action of self-gravity until they begin forming uh, the stars locally, and the, the little dots are the stars. Mm -hmm. We presented this simulation in a paper with Jonathan Heiner, who was my postdoc by, at that time uh, at ERIA. So in the paper with Jonathan, what we did is use, we used this simulation to produce a very crude emulation of radiative transfer and chemistry so that we could track what fraction of the clouds, which, we, which were supposed to start out as atomic, became molecular. Mm -hmm. And so without going into the details of how we did the chemistry and, and the very crude radiative transfer, we just 
tracked the formation of molecular gas, which here is shown in red, while the cold neutral medium, the cold atomic medium is shown in green. And what you can see is that at different times, so here the time is indicated, oops, sorry, uh, uh, and here, so from here, this is 12.5 million years <clears throat> into the simulation, 25 million years, 34 uh, million years, and you can see that the molecular gas fraction is increasing over time. Mm -hmm. Then more recently in a paper with Vianney Camacho, what we did is we took this same simulation and performed a case study of how one cloud evolved. And I already talked about this, uh, this paper uh, in a previous colloquium here at the Institute. So uh, I'll go quick over these next few slides. Basically what we did is we just took one cloud uh -huh, chosen randomly uh, just so that it didn't cross the boundary so that it was easy to follow, for example and looked at its evolution for a few million years. How to define a cloud is very tricky. People who have been dealing with numerical simulations have realized that uh, clouds are not an easy object to define because they are part of a continuum. So we're trying to isolate something which is part of a, of a large continuum. So normally what we do is we define them by density thresholds We numericists. Observers define them by what they can see in a certain tracer or something like that. So defining them by density thresholds, so what connected regions above density thresholds, we found that this cloud, interestingly, was increasing its mass uh, more or less at constant radius. And this is what you can see here. This is the cloud evolving at uh, over a couple of million years. And you see that it's actually getting slightly bigger, mm -hmm, but not that much, but its mass is increasing significantly. And so that means that it's, uh, its mean density increases and also the density contrast increases. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, you see that uh, here, now at, towards the end, you see that there's very dense regions indicated by, by uh, white color, but at the beginning, which is here, there was no white. So there was no uh, very dense part of this cloud. So what we did is we compared this cloud, numerical cloud, with a couple of real clouds what, um, at different evolutionary stages that are known to be at different evolutionary stages. Uh, one of them was the pipe, which is like a prototypical young cloud with almost no star formation. Uh, it has a mass of about 8,000 solar masses defined at some um, extinction uh, threshold, for example. And there's data available for the cores that it contains uh, by a number of, of, uh, of, pap of papers from last decade. Mm -hmm. Then the other cloud we chose for comparison was a more evolved cloud. It, it, it was an infrared dark cloud, called, which I'll be just calling G14. And this is a cloud that contains already uh, significant star formation. And it contains not only uh, low mass cores, it contains clumps, filaments, and high mass cores. Mm -hmm. So this is a more evolved cloud and it has a, a mass uh, of about 20,000 solar masses. And we have, and for these two clouds, we, we have data or either we either measured it for, uh, for G14 or grabbed it from the literature for the pipe uh, on the velocity dispersions and the masses for the substructures in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we compared the simulated cloud to these two observed clouds at different times. And so it turns out that the cloud looks rather similar to the pipe at some time in the simulation, about 20, uh, 20 and a half million years in the simulation. And then uh, slightly less than a couple of million years later, it looks more like G14. Why do we say that? It's, it has an increased mass. It has an increased uh, density gradient. So for example, or density contrast, see, for example, that in the early epoch, the cloud, uh, we defined the cloud and the clump and a core by different density thresholds, but the density thresholds are just based by increments of 2,000 uh, uh, 
particles per cubic centimeter. So the blue, the uh, dark blue is a thousand, uh, the cyan is 3000 and the orange is 5000. So this is a linear increment in the density contrast. In, in contrast, a couple of million years later, the, the cloud has developed a very sharp density contrast. Now the contours are spaced at factors of 10. So this is a, a thousand again, but this is 10,000 and the yellow is a uh, hundred thousand particles per cubic centimeter. The mass has also increased by uh, and has about doubled. So it, it turns out that our cloud more or less reproduces what is observed in the other clouds, uh, in the observed clouds. Then what we did is we, uh, we tracked the uh, the locus of some of the cores in our simulated cloud in this diagram. This is a very interesting diagram, which plots the, the so-called Larson ratio versus the column density. The Larson ratio is the velocity dispersion divided by the size of the, of the clump to the one half power. And this is a rough measure of the ratio of kinetic energy to gravitational energy. And uh, so the lines here, the straight lines, uh, correspond to either variable equilibrium or to free fall here. And it is, uh, and so here we plotted the cores in the pipe, which are these uh, purple cores, and the blue cores are those, of, or and clumps are those of G14. And then the, the uh, empty circles represent the evolution of the cores in our cloud. And we see that they move from uh, the locus, which is occupied by the pipe cores, to the locus of the of G14 cores in this span of about a couple of million years. Not only that, the star formation activity also evolves and it evolves from having no, no star formation activity. Black here means no, uh, no stars formed yet in the, numerical, in, in the numerical cores. And then the colors indicate the star formation rate here indicated. So for example, this is 100 solar masses per mega year, and this is 500 solar masses per mega year. So the final star formation rates are, they started out zero, and then they end up with uh, rates of about 500 solar masses per mega year. But these don't last very long because in a simulation with feedback, the, the, these stars would blow away the clumps really quickly. But so the conclusion is from this part that the clumps with, in the molecular clouds in, within the context of our simulation, which is within the, gravita, the global hierarchical collapse, evolve. And so they increase both their mass and their star formation activity. And so the evolution takes them from the conditions of low mass and low star formation rate regions to those of high mass, high star formation rate regions. So there is clear evolution from low mass to high mass in a span of a few million years. But how does this happen? Why, why is the, the cloud able to grow even though it's forming stars? For that, we turn to another simulation which we presented almost 10 years ago. This is, uh, uh, it's amazing. We keep extracting information from this simulation. Uh, this is a simulation also uh, of, uh, this is a simulation of colliding flows in a box of the same size. So 256 parsec box, but now this simulation includes feedback. And so you see that the feedback, uh, feedback from, uh, uh, UV photoionization radiation that creates H2 regions and then blows the gas away. It has a rather pedestrian uh, uh, prescription for the feedback, but it, it, it does the job. So you see the H2 regions expanding and uh, the gas being expelled from the, the regions where the clusters form. And there's three clusters that form in this simulation. In this simulation, uh, in a paper with Alejandro Gonzalez uh, and myself uh, from last year, what we did is we measured, again, we measured the mass around the cluster in a simulation with feedback and compared it with the simulation without feedback. And what we found, so this is the, simu uh, the solid lines represent the simulation with feedback and the dotted lines, the simulation without feedback. Uh, what's interesting is that the mass of the, of the stars that form in this simulation uh, gradually increases with time. So finally, at, a, at about 5 million years after the first star formed, this zero here in time is the time when the first star formed. And this time here is when a massive enough star forms that it blows away the cloud. 
Mm -hmm. And so you can see that, uh, and the different lines are uh, indicating the mass of the dense gas contained in spheres of the indicated radii here. So the, this uh, magenta line is a sphere of uh, radius one parsec, the blue line is a sphere of radius two parsecs and so on, until the gray line is a sphere of uh, 20 parsec radius. And so this, this is the mass. And you again, you see the same phenomenon. You see the dense gas mass increasing until now we have the feedback until the massive star begins to blow away the cloud. But what's interesting is that the, the stellar mass is also increasing, but it increases less. Proportionally, it increases more. I mean, uh, the, the this rate of star formation compared to the mass in stars is large, but compared to the mass in gas is low. So what that means is that even though we're forming stars, so here you see the, the simulations uh, at, at the different, within and the mass in stars within the same spheres, you see that in both simulations, the mass, the stellar mass is increasing with feedback. The stellar mass, however, increases more slowly, but that only happens after the star, the, the star begins to blow away the clouds. What's interesting is that the mass in stars is increasing, but yet the gas mass is increasing as well. This has a very important consequence that the star formation efficiency that we measure is always low because we normally define the star formation efficiency as the gas, as the stellar mass divided by the gas plus the stellar mass. So if the gas mass is increasing faster than the stellar mass, then it turns out that the star formation efficiency always remains low. And so in both simulations with no feedback and with feedback, the star formation efficiency that we measure is low. And it's not because we're forming stars at a low rate, it's because the cloud is accreting faster than it is forming stars. This is really strange, we didn't expect this. So this was the conclusion from this. The clumps gain mass faster than they can put it into stars. Again, but why, why, why is this happening? So, you know, I was even worried that there was something wrong with the simulations. But then uh, this paper came out with uh, Gilberto Gomez and Aina Palau from last year, in which I think we began to understand what, what's happening. What's, what we did here is not a simulation, it's an analytical study. It's an analytical study of how the, the density profile of a core that is beginning to collapse and eventually reaching the point when it forms a star uh, evolves its, uh, its density uh, profile. So how does the profile, the density profile of this core evolve in time? So what happens is we know that a collapsing object, th this is from the very old simulations from, uh, um, from Richard Larson. And what we know is that a core that is beginning to collapse at the beginning is essentially flat density, but then the central part begins to grow it, and the central part becomes shorter and shorter, but with a higher and higher density. So if you, uh, and the central part is always flat uh -huh, until you form a star. The, the central part doesn't become sharp until you form a star. So this can be approximated by different slopes of the, of the density profile if you average the, the flat part and the, and the envelope part. Mm -hmm. And so you can represent it as an increasing slope of the density profile in the core. Mm -hmm. So this is what we did. Then what did we, did we do? We assumed something very simple. We just assumed that the velocity <clears throat> was the gravitationally driven velocity. So it's just uh, the square root of GM over R mm -hmm. at every radius. So uh, the velocity as a function of radius is just the gravitational velocity driven by the mass internal to that radius. And then we also assume that the density was a, a power law of the radius uh -huh. with, the, with the exponent being a function of time. Then we worked out the evolution, the, the evolution equation for this exponent p mm -hmm. and it come out, comes out to that. Never mind about this more complicated part, it is positive definite. The, the important part of this is that this is positive definite. The only thing that is not positive definite is this coefficient here. So this is the, the rate of change of the slope of the density profile 
and it is uh, it has this factor which is a function of p itself. So what we can see from here is that if p is larger than two, then the derivative if, if p is larger than two, then this thing is negative, and then dp and dt is is negative, uh -huh. and vice versa. If p is less than two, then dp and dt is positive, uh -huh. and so in both cases. It turns out that the, the value of p equals two is an attractor, meaning that uh, both uh, slopes, uh, slopes less than two and larger than two tend to two. So p, is, uh, p equals two is an attractor for this slope here. This is very interesting. And also there is a very interesting result, which is at this value of p, the accretion rate is independent of radius. So when, when the slope is two, then all of the matter that enters from the outside of the core reaches the center of the core mm -hmm. and nothing is accumulated. But for P less than two, more mass enters on the outer parts than goes out in the inner parts. So the gas sort of chokes, it, it gets stuck along the way, stuck along the way from the outside to the center. And that allows the core to grow in mass because it is not capable of bringing all of the material that it is accreting from the outside into its stars. And so less gas goes to the center than enters at the outside. And note, notice that there's no need for support or of any kind here, no need for turbulent magnetic nor even thermal support. This is just gravity not bringing able to bring the material fast enough from the outer parts to the inner parts. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what we did in that paper as well was to get a collection of the observational data uh, for P, uh, for the values of P in observed course. Uh, and so this was just like a compilation of reported slopes in, in molecular, in, in dense cores. And we see that both in high mass cores and in low mass cores, uh, the typical value of the slope is less than two. So in general, all of these cores are capable of retaining some of the mass for themselves rather than transferring it all the, uh, directly to the stars. Mm -hmm. So this, to my mind, was a big relief because it allowed us to uh, explain why the cores are able to grow uh, it, in mass while they're forming stars. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I'm going to skip this because it's a little bit off the track and I want to, to keep the focus. Uh, this is like a side consequence. I can get back to this later if possible. But I would like to go into the accretion onto filaments, which, is, which are sort of the intermediate uh, st stage between the cloud scale and the core scale. Mm -hmm. And this is work that uh, we, uh, we have put in the paper with Raul Naranjo and Robert Lachnan, and it's submitted onto monthly notices right now. So this concerns filament, filaments formed by gravitational contraction. Uh, this is another simulation in which you can see, let me back up again. This is a simulation of colliding flows in again, a 256 parsec box, but this is a zoom of that simulation of only 20 parsecs on the side. And we see that uh, filaments form just by gravitational contraction by anisotropic gravitational contraction. The, the standard lore these days is that filaments are formed by turbulence, uh, in, like in shocks and things like that. But here we see that these filaments, although there is turbulence, these are formed by the large scale collapse. Mm -hmm. And what happens in, in uh, why does this happen? Because there's an old result from the 1960s where it is clearly stated that, that for example, a triaxial uh, ellipsoid collapses, that is subject just to its self-gravity, collapses fastest along the shortest dimension. So it collapses from a spheroid to a sheet, and then from the sheet into a filament, and then from the filament into, into a roundish thing again. And then maybe the thing can repeat itself and go through another sequence of sheet, filament, and so on. Mm -hmm. So this can be a self-similar type of filament production mechanism. 
what we reported in the paper uh, with Gilberto Gomez in, in 2014 was that the flow in this, in, in this kind of filament production changes direction smoothly from being perpendicular to the filament to longitudinal. So this is an image of the column density in the, in the filament with velocity vectors shown. And you see that the velocity, velocity vectors on the outside are directed towards the filament. And inside the filament, they change direction and go into the central hub. Uh, so uh, a, a side result, a, a collateral result, is that because of this smooth change in direction, there should be no strong shocks at the filament's axis. There's a, just, there's a smooth change of direction. And Gilberto and I have been struggling to, to create an analytical model for this, but so far is putting up a good fight. So we haven't been able to do it yet. But uh, what's important then is that the filaments are accreting from its, their parent cloud and then bringing that material into the core. And th this constitutes what we think of as the large scale collapse flow. You can, you can see this is on a 20 parsec scale, for example. And uh, what I want to always say, and I, I, I don't think it's uh, uh, too much to repeat it, this in my mind is very similar to what happens in a river. The, ma the material is going to the high uh, potential, uh, high gravitational potential zones to the low, to, to the, to the lowest parts of the gravitational potential, and then they flow along there to the overall low minimum of the gravitational potential. So you could, if, if this were a plot of the of gravitational potential of this region, it would be highest here, intermediate here, and minimum here. And this is exactly what's happening in a river. And so this filament can last a long time, but it's never made of the same material. It's just providing a funnel for the material to flow. So in the paper with uh, Raul and Robert, what we did is uh, we took an idealized uh, model of, of this process. We just set up a numerical simulation, scale-free, isothermal, in which we had a, a box containing on the order of three genes lengths per side. And in that box, we introduced a, a cylindrical perturbation and Inside that cylindrical perturbation, we introduced a spherical perturbation in order to create a, a, an overall perturbation that looks like a cylinder with a central core. And then we let the system just evolve. Uh -huh. And we, what we did is we took a slice uh, of the cylinder, like uh, illustrated here, and then we measured the, the mass flux uh, across the longitudinal dimension and across the perpendicular wall of the uh, of the of this slice of the cylinder, and so you can you can see that uh, the material coming in through uh, surface A and the material coming in through surface B is the net inflow ma mass inflow rate into the cylinder, and the material going out through C is the outflow rate. Mm -hmm. And then we measured this, uh, the ratio of these two uh, mass flow rates. So the outflow rate uh, divided by the inflow rate. And this is what we found. Mm -hmm. We found that uh, this, this rate seems to increase with time. And so at the beginning, the, the outflow rate, rate is lower than the inflow rate. And so that means that the, the cylinder slice is increasing its mass but then it approaches unity. It overshoots a little bit here and we couldn't track the simulation further. So we need to do that in a follow-up paper. But here, but for now, we see that this is tending towards the quality of the two rates. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the two rates become equal, then what happens? Then you have a, the mass of the slice becomes stationary, the mass of the cylinder becomes stationary, and it is just precisely becoming a uh, like a channel for the material to flow from the gas from the box scale from the scale of the whole box to the scale of the core. Mm -hmm. So, with that, uh, I have more or less uh, covered the various aspects of uh, the accretion and the uh, and the collapse that I wanted to to mention. So the first point is gravitational collapse should be thought of as the uh, 
generating a flow, not as a single uh, point-wise isolated event, which is wh why, uh, like what most of us tend to think of when we think of gravitational collapse. We just think of something going pop, and that's it. But no, gravitational contraction can bring material from, at least in the molecular cloud scale, from very large scales. And of course, you can you could extend this all the way to extragalactic flows falling into the galaxy, but that's another story. Mm -hmm. Then accretion in, in the molecular era in the star formation environment happens at all scales. It connects structures with their environment. It causes evolution of the structures, or in the case of filaments, it can bring them into stationary states, but in, in which nothing is hydrostatic, it's just a, a stationary state. In particular, molecular cloud mass increases with time until uh, the destruction of the cloud by feedback. So the, the clouds are not isolated. They are not hydrostatic. They're totally dynamic. And they are in first increasing their masses. And they're increasing their masses because they are receiving material from the outside and transferring it to the stars, but at different rates. The rate at which they accrete is larger than the rate at which they form stars. Then, when the massive stars form, they destroy the cloud and that's it. Mm -hmm. And therefore the clouds can evolve from being low mass, high, uh, low mass star forming regions to high mass star forming regions. And like I said, this is caused by an increase in their mass, in their mass at roughly constant size. That is, uh, they can go from being a low mass cloud to a high mass cloud. Then, oops, uh, the cloud, oops, I'm pushing the, the wheel here. The cloud mass increases faster than the stellar mass, and this allows the star formation e efficiency to remain low. The measured star formation efficiency seems low because the cloud is increasing its mass faster than the stars it's forming. And so the ratio of stellar mass to gas mass remains low all the time. And this turns out to happen because the accretion flow sort of chokes when, this, when the density profile is shallower than minus two, which was a completely unexpected result. We, were, we have been looking for ways to support the clouds for decades. And it might be just that gravity cannot funnel the material quickly enough. And then finally, it allows for a quasi-stationary state of the filamentary flow. And, and so filaments should be thought of as flows, uh, uh, like Hilberto says, as flow features rather than material features. They are not objects. They are just flow patterns in, in which the material is just going from the cloud scale to the core scale. Thank you very much. And I'll, I can take questions here. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Enrique. Mm -hmm. uh, I see we have already have a question from Roberto. Go ahead, Roberto. Mm -hmm. Hi, Enrique. Uh, Hi. And I, this this new result of the of the of the threshold um, density profile of two, um, mm -hmm. I, I like it, but I, I wonder if it's too optimistic in the sense that <laughs> you know um, accretion. I mean, you are assuming a spherical geometry at all scales, no? Exactly. And mm -hmm. we, we know at at at, lar at scales larger than cores, fragmentation in the cloud doesn't have a single center mm -hmm. of collapse, but it has many, mm -hmm. and also accretion toward the core, in many cases, is supposed to go through filaments, yes. which mm -hmm. do not cover the four pi. I mean, essentially exactly. what you are getting is that the, the matter transfers uh, yes, in the yes. entire uh, four pi uh, R squared uh, area. Mm -hmm. no? yeah. if, you, if you only have a fraction of that cross section and you have multiple centers of collapse, Absolutely, yes. Possible mm -hmm. that the threshold, the effective thresh, threshold uh, for power the law will be uh, more restrictive. So um, in reality, mm -hmm. you will have a, on, only a fraction of cores that will continue accreting, whereas others might be well isolated from the, from the will not continue growing in mass, no? Or, or what's, what's your take on that? Uh, yeah, well, actually, yeah, that's a perfectly good question. Uh, and in fact, I have struggled with that. But actually, I think what you said may actually provide the solution to one problem that we have still pending, which is 
uh, we, in principle, when you consider spherical geometry, the slope of minus two is reached precisely at the time when you form a singularity, that meaning a protostar at the center. Mm -hmm. But here we, see, and so uh, what I, the next question I've been having is what keeps the slope less than minus two, or shallower than minus two, even after we have formed stars? Mm -hmm. And I think precise, so this business of, uh, of considering spherical geometry can be dealt with by thinking that you can take spherical regions around your star forming uh, region. <laughs> sorry, sorry for the redundancy. So spherical volumes around your star forming region, and then just measuring the total accretion rate, which is what we did with Alejandro, for example. So what, then you can measure the total rate over this uh, spherical uh, area. And so this, this still surprising result is that the, when you average spherically, the slope continues to be less than minus two, shallower than minus two. And precisely I'm thinking that it is perhaps filaments, accretion through filaments rather than in a spherically symmetric manner that allows the overall av spherically average profile less than minus two because the filament tends to have more or less constant density. So it will contribute towards, shall uh, towards flattening the, the average, uh, the spherically average density profile. So, so, so you in, will have in the center the, the quasi-spherical thing with the slope less than minus two, and then in the outskirts, say, filament with, with, with a radial gradient around two, but because they are averaged out, you get less than that. That's what you're saying? The, uh, exactly. The yeah, filament, so. actually, the filaments tend to have almost constant density throughout their length. That, that is right, very yeah. interesting, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and so what, what this causes is that when you average their contribution to the mass in a spherical average, uh, it, con it, it contributes to making the overall density profile shallower. Yeah. Than minus two. And so I'm thinking that that might be the reason why the slope remains uh, shallower than minus two, even after having formed stars. But uh, nevertheless, I, I, when I presented this in France a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, Patrick and Abel, for example, wanted to see if perhaps it was turbulent pressure, which was contributing to keeping the, the profile lower than minus two. And so we're going to explore that as well. But the idea is that when you average the, the, the accretion rate over a sphere, then I think the, the, the spherical result should hold. If the slope is less than minus two, then you should uh, be able to sort of keep the material in the course. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks Roberto. Uh, we have Will Henny. Okay. Hi, Enrique. Uh, Hi. Nice talk. Hi, and uh, I, I have a couple of questions, one about filaments and one about time evolution. I can't hear you. You can't hear me? No. You can't hear me? Uh, now I can. Mm -hmm. okay, oh, now right. I can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So I have a couple of questions, one about mm -hmm. filaments and one mm -hmm. about time evolution. So mm -hmm. about filaments, you see that with things like the pipe nebula, you often mm -hmm. see that the, the, neb the, the, the main filament has sort of lots of perpendicular little filaments. Mm -hmm. is, is, are, is that, are, are they feeding? The, are, they, are, are the little filaments feeding the big filaments in that case? Or, or is it a sort of an optical illusion? <laughs> you, you mean the ones that come sort of perpendicularly into the main filaments? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it seems to us, like I said, this filamentation due to self-gravity can very well be like a scale-free phenomenon because it's just due to, to self-gravity, right? So uh, you, if, it's, uh, if you have the main uh, converging flow going uh, first into a sheet and then the sheet can, like, compresses into a filament, then this flow itself can undergo the same type of instability mm -hmm. i would call it and form secondary filaments into uh, feeding the the main one. And, yeah. and and how i mean how 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 low a, how small scales can this go down to can it explain things like the 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 interstellar cirrus 
which also filamentary, and everybody always says that it's magnetic fields. That I don't Could that know. Be a similar phenomenon. There, I would not put my hand in the fire, like we say here, yet, uh -huh. because I'm not sure that those structures are locally self gravitating. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and yeah. of course, it's interesting because those may form by thermal instability. And that's what Guido Granda is investigating now. And it, it, it's very interesting because the thermal instability in many situations acts similarly to the gravitational instability and it also produces filaments. So it might okay. as well be that those are produced by, not by gene instability, but by thermal instability. Uh -huh. or, but, but also we argue sometimes that the gravitational contraction may start at the cold sea, at, at the cold atomic gas. So, uh, but there, I, I still don't know. I still don't know okay. what scales are locally okay. gene unstable. So the, my, my second question gas. about the, it's my Oops. second question about the time evolution. Mm -hmm. you, you talk about that when the stars are created, they will destroy the cloud. Mm -hmm. But often you see multiple generations of star formation in the same region with mm -hmm. separation of a few million years or whatever. Do you have yeah. any comment on, 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 on that? Yes, uh, actually, we, we did investigate that in the paper with, with Alejandro. And, uh, and, and indeed, because in the filaments, we have um, secondary star formation on the filament before they reach the main hub. So it's, all of this seems to be very much uh, um, self uh, scale free. So in fact, I can, if I can share again, I think I have okay. uh, another plot here. Um, okay, so let me see if I have it. Uh, yeah, here, yeah. So this is from uh, the paper, the filament paper with Hilberto in 2014. And this is uh, essentially the same filament I was showing. And what you're seeing in the grayscale is the column density. And on the solid line is the longitudinal velocity along the filament. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and that is measured with this axis on the top. Mm -hmm. So this is the longitudinal velocity and positive uh, is on the left. So that means that this material is flowing upwards and this material is flowing downwards. And so you see that the main formation, uh, the main hub is this region here. And here's where the main discontinuity in, in the velocity occurs. But we have secondary formation of, of little cores for example, here and another one here with their respective little jumps in velocity. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this seems to be like a, a very, um, a very scale free process. And now okay. what's interesting is, is that these can produce star formation at different times. Mm -hmm. So for example, in many occasions we see that these can collapse or not collapse by the time this one has formed a big star. So in the paper with, with Alejandro, we checked and looked at the star formation in the secondary objects here. And we found that, for example, several of them were going to form stars, but some others were triggered. And some of them are formed uh, with a time delay of a, of a few million years precisely. So we can show you that in more detail yeah. later. But yeah, well, I it suppose accounts you perfectly could, for you this. Could have, um, mm -hmm. You could have it that the, the central region was mm -hmm. evacuated due to a, a burst of star formation. Exactly. But then the large scale accretion could then build up again and cause exactly. a, another, somewhere else. another episode yeah. a few million it's, years later. So. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'll stop sharing here. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Uh, we have uh, Javier. We can't hear you. <laughs> Three, four, do you hear mm -hmm. me? Yes, no? yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So, uh, hi again. Um, two questions. Uh, first of all, uh, in, in the case of, the, of this uh, semi-analytic model that you made for the for, uh, profile, the density profile, mm -hmm. I'm worried that uh, that might be consequence of the assumptions that you are making for that model. Uh, the, the reason why I'm telling this is because when I saw the paper, uh, I haven't read it uh, carefully, but uh, when I saw the paper, the first reaction I had is to measure myself 
mm -hmm. in my simulations, what will be the density profile. And I find that uh, only in a small region of the core, you have this, uh, this slope of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, R to the minus two, so the density mm -hmm. going at, uh, as R to the minus two. Uh, Outside, it's steeper. Inside, it's quite flat, even though the, my core has, or my different cores that I test, uh, have inner structure. So, so somehow I felt that it, we might be um, kind of falling in the same uh, mistake as, uh, as Kronholz, no? Arguing <laughs> that. That global. I, I didn't say it. He said it. <laughs> yeah. Global yeah, that that is getting insulting, is it? And yeah. you're being recorded, you know. Well, of course, if you, if you, you, if you stop, if you and your mass, of course, this is not going to happen. I mean, if, 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 you if, mass is finite, if, if, if the mass is not infinite in the reservoir, then at, at some point it has to decline. So mm -hmm. yeah. uh, well, what I mean is, isn't again, no, yeah. isn't mm -hmm. again kind of the result of the assumptions that you are using? <laughs> okay, the short answer is no. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. But uh, so the, for the two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, first, yes, we are now measuring the slope, the, the density profiles, uh, but in a spherically averaged way, just like I, I said, like I showed in, uh, mm -hmm. in Alejandro's paper. Mm -hmm. So in, in that case, Yes, of course, there are going to be fluctuations, but this the gravitational potential, which by the way, is much smoother than the density because it's uh, the gravitational potential is like the second integral of the density field. Right? Mm -hmm. So the gravitational potential tends to focus much more on the large scales than on the small scales. So the gravitational potential is going to be much smoother and therefore, averaging spherically is not such a bad idea. And then what you can do is understand that, understand what's happening on, in an average sense on spherical volumes. Yeah, that, that's in what fact, it is. Yeah, and, and so that's what we're doing. So in, in, in part, we already did it in, in Alejandro's paper. We measured the, the mass in spherical volumes and then computed the average, the spherically average density profile. And that's what comes out less than minus two. And precisely I'm thinking, but now the question is why does it sort of stop be below minus two? So it's not reaching minus two. And it might be because precisely the, so the, I agree the, the fact that things are not spherical, that the, 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 we don't have spherical cows is affecting our result, but maybe what it is affecting is that the attractor is not minus two. It sort of stumbles in between because the, the filaments are preventing the slope from becoming minus two, but the spherical average still matters because that's very representative of, of what the gravitational potential is doing. Oh, okay, okay. I, I, I guess we have to, to look at that in detail. Yeah, uh, yeah. and in, in any case, reading, that, but, but that's what, what I, we're doing. What, what we're I, doing. Yeah. Yeah, but what I did, uh, did is exactly mm -hmm. spherical mm -hmm. averages mm -hmm. in, in, in my core at different, with different spheres. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get that result. No, no, yeah, of course, we, you get like very flat. No, 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 no. As a spherical averages, what I got mm -hmm. is a flat thing. And then a small part, which has a slope of minus two, but is a very small in size. Mm -hmm. And then something steeper. Yes, absolutely. I agree. But in fact, that's what I showed. But now I think I cannot share anymore. Can I? Um, because I can, because that's exactly what we said. Of course, this is only an approximation. But what we did is we assumed that we could model the central flat part, which is exactly what you expect. Mm 
plus the, the minus two envelope, like an like a mean slope with this, uh, like a mean radial profile with an average slope less than minus two. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what we did. Yeah, we, we modeled this flat part on the top with this, with a, a minus two here as a combined less than minus two slope. Mm -hmm. That's okay, what we did. Let's look at that later. Yeah, okay. okay. And then I for, forget yeah, what the, was the, the filament stuff. Uh, oh yeah, I, I know we have argued uh, we have argued about this endlessly, but the the idea is very simple. It's again a, a matter of it's a similar argument to what brings the attractor for the slope of minus two. It, it, without going into details, if you compute the accretion flow uh, into uh, along the filament, uh -huh, then the accretion flow is given by the linear mass density times the velocity times the area, if I don't remember mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. incorrectly. Mm -hmm. So what happens if the accretion, and this gives you the mass rate flowing into the core. Now assume you have a certain accretion rate onto the filament. If the accretion rate onto the filament is larger than the accretion rate along the filament, then that will uh, increase the linear mass density in the filament, and that will increase the, uh, the flow. Mm -hmm. So it will tend to increase the accretion rate along the, 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 the filament. Yes, so I mean, if vice you, versa, if, if, if your accretion rate onto the filament is less than along the filament, then that will tend to drain the filament and reduce it's it's uh, it's linear mass density so it seems to tend to it is an argument exactly like the other one it seems like the stationary flow is an attractor for the filament and i know it's idealized and so on and so forth but nature is but to what extent do the details change the global picture i would ask well i think that uh, uh, making the statement that it's uh, equal that that, that it, it has to be that way it's a strong statement no, well, and, that's and what I we're don't testing. think that the simulations that, that the plot that you showed, I mean, it goes up. If mm -hmm. you go to two, three, four times, maybe go keeps going on. And I guess that will depend on the mass reservoir that you. Oh have. yeah, absolutely. That's why I said a quasi-stationary state. It cannot last. No, longer. no, no. I mean, if you have a, a large mass reservoir, I, I, my feeling is that you will go end up with even more, more, uh, a larger ratios. That's why I said quasi-stationary so, because so, the accretion, so, because. Uh, the, what we need to take into account is that by quasi-stationary, I mean on the time scale of the filament. But the other rate of change is on the time scale of the cloud. The cloud has a longer time scale because it has a lower density and therefore it has a, lo a large, longer freefall time. So yes, it is only quasi-stationary in the sense that it's stationary as long as you can neglect the time, the, the time scale for change at the cloud scale. That is, I totally agree. That's why I said quasi-stationary, but uh, so but it's stationary at the on the time scale of the filament, which is shorter than that of the cloud. But uh, how short? Oh, just take it uh, well. It's a factor of the square root of the densities. The mean density in the filament to the minus one half power versus the mean density in the cloud to the minus one half power. Mm. Well, mm -hmm. let's let's. Go yeah, I know I'll never convince you, but. <laughs> <laughs> Let's okay. Yeah. And so I don't know if we have any else. So yes, uh, we we did have one question. Uh, Vero, I think you had your hand up. Uh, I don't know if you still wanted to ask that question. Yes, I did. It, it took uh, some time. <laughs> uh, something that you it was referring to. Uh, you were referring to at the end of uh, Roberto's question. Mm -hmm. I was wondering. Now it seems like uh, everything is gravity. <laughs> Yes, sort of. Well, uh, with turbulent fluctuations, yes. Uh, which is a bit surprising still that, I mean, it was, okay, whatever. Mm -hmm. What I was wondering is now that you have No, I, I, I can just tell you that I have been asked that many, many times. So just this last conference, somebody asked me, okay, so what made you change? <laughs> and I can later I tell you the story of what no, made no, you change. I, okay, mm -hmm. no, it was not in that. No, it, it's, 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 yeah, it's like an anecdote thing, yeah. But Still, uh, you have the gravity now you're seeing that is uh, a really a great effect when mm -hmm. you are forming stars. 
And I was uh, thinking when you were saying that the density of the gas uh, increases uh, more rapidly than in the stars. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I was wondering, this is with only gravity. So what happens, still you have turbulence, you still you have uh, magnetic fields. So in which uh, scale would that enhance, for example, uh, um, the density in both cases? Yes, uh, that, that's a very good question. Um, so the thing is, I don't mean it's only gravity. What we yeah, have yeah. found, for what we have found, in fact, I have to say that uh, in some other conference, some colleagues asked me, well, now you're bringing back turbulence, no? And yes, we're bringing back turbulence because we need yeah. the turbulent density fluctuations inside the clouds in order for them to have shorter freefall time scales than the whole cloud. Mm -hmm. But so uh, then what we have found is that precisely I came to the conclusion that it is gravity when we started doing simulations of self-consistent cloud formation. Mm -hmm. So. So that means including Actually, I also also mm -hmm. uh, turbulence and magnetic fields exactly and gravity? exactly mm -hmm. okay. exactly so uh, I'm going there so basically first I uh, I became yeah. interested so yeah. what happens the, the short story is we realized at the beginning of the century or I've realized that the way you drive turbulence is crucial for the for its effects. Mm -hmm. So more or less at around 2005, I was finding some results about the control of the star formation rate by turbulence. And somebody else was finding just the opposite results, mm -hmm. Lee and Nakamura. They were finding that enhanced with the larger Mach numbers of the turbulence caused larger star formation efficiencies, for example. And mm -hmm. I was finding that larger Mach numbers were producing lower star formation efficiencies. And then it hit me. The difference between their study and ours is that we were driving the turbulence continuously and we were, let, uh, uh, sorry, we were driving it continuously and they were letting it decay. Mm -hmm. So I said, what we need to know is what is the turbulence really like in the molecular clouds, right? So, uh, because it just depends on your model, right? Is, is it continuously driven? Is it decaying? Is it partially decaying and then driven again? So I try to do self-consistent models of the, the turbulence driving in the clouds. That's when we came up with the colliding flow scenario for forming clouds, because I had seen somebody else in another conference showing how the Vizniak instability in the compressed layer uh, between colliding streams generates turbulence. And so I thought, oh, okay, that's the source of the turbulence and that is totally self-consistent. So I started doing simulations of that, and then I found mm, the turbulence is okay. You know, it's moderately supersonic, not strongly supersonic. Then we did simulations of cloud formation with self gravity, and surprise, surprise! I was thinking that this turbulence would keep the cloud inflated, so to speak, but no, the the cloud would collapse as soon as it reached the sheen's mass. Mm -hmm. So that's when I decided oh, okay, turbulence is not really supporting the clouds. And in fact, our simulations without turbulence showed that the Mach numbers that you obtain with this mechanism are not enough to, to reproduce the observed Mach numbers in molecular clouds. Okay, and then okay. we realized that it was the, the info that generates those, those Mach numbers. And then we did the same type of simulations with magnetic fields. And, and of course, it depends on whether your cloud is magnetically super or subcritical. But then we realized everything in the galaxy is supercritical because, because the flux, because if the compression occurs more or less perpendicular, uh, uh, parallel to the field lines, then you have an unlimited supply of mass along the field lines to put into your cloud. And so everything is supercritical and that's confirmed by observations. Most of the clouds and cores are, are observed to be sub, uh, supercritical. So they're not supported by the magnetic field either. So that's when I came to the conclusion nothing is able to prevent the gravitational collapse. But I, I mean, so there's a history behind this. It's, it's not that I just smoked something and, uh, uh, and then came up with the idea. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, let us uh, thank our speaker. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, good. and uh, we have another talk.
next week. So we'll see everyone next week again. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Bye -bye.